Hello, hello! Welcome back to Loki's Librarian. If you are new here, welcome. I am your librarian, Katrina, and this is where I'm reading through the enormous library books that you see behind me, and then I give you a quick synopsis and tell you what I think about them. So if you like books, just aren't sure what to read next, hit that subscribe button, like and share my videos, and let me know what you think in the comments. It is the last Sunday of the month, making this week's book of the week our 27th president, The William Howard Taft Presidency by Lewis L. Gold. The accompanying cocktail is the Taft Cocktail, which was originally created to honor President Taft on, in New Orleans during one of his national speaking tours. It is one ounce of bourbon, bourbon, one ounce of sweet vermouth, a quarter ounce of Benedictine, and a quarter ounce of Amer Pecan, although I am substituting with Torriani brand Amer because they didn't have Amer Pecan at my store. The cocktail glass is rimmed with a mixture of lemon and lime juice, and it's supposed to be dipped in powdered sugar. Um, I have powdered sugar. It is unopened. I wasn't going to open a big bag of powdered sugar just to rim the glass, so I used regular sugar. I'm sure that's cheating, but I don't really care. So let's do this. William Howard Taft was born September 15, 1857 in Cincinnati, Ohio, to the second wife of Alfonso Taft, who had been Attorney General under President Ulysses S. Grant and then American Minister to Austria-Hungary under Chester A. Arthur. Alfonso Taft had three sons with his first wife and five children with his second wife, Louise Torrey Taft, of whom William Howard was the second born but the first to survive. They, they had an older child who died before Taft was born. Yeah. Taft went to Yale College, graduating in 1878, so this was before it was a university, was a member of the uh, Secretive Skull and Bone Society. He studied law school at the Cincinnati Law, Sc Cincinnati law School, Vermouth. Um, he, he's, oh shit, I lost my place. He studied law at the Cincinnati Law School, was admitted to the Ohio Bar in 1881. In 1886, he married Helen Nellie Heron, and the couple had three children, Robert, Helen, and Charles II. I'm not sure why, where the second came from, but that was his name. So, uh, he served as Solicitor General under President Benjamin Harrison, which means he represented the government in cases that went before the Supreme Court, where the U.S. was one of the named parties. Um, he was Solicitor General for about two years before being appointed to the Federal Court of Appeals in the 6th District, uh, which covers Ohio, Kentucky, Michigan, and Tennessee. Hmm, I really hope I got enough of the bourbon in there. If I screwed that up, I might have. I might have screwed that up. I went with the tiny glass, and I may have screwed myself up. That is really thick. So he was a happy judge. I mean, he, he I mean, those, this was something he, he enjoyed this line of work. He liked the law. He liked being a judge. And uh, while some of his court rulings didn't win him any friends with organized labor, uh, he was consistently, I mean, like by all accounts, he was pretty good at his job. I mean, labor hated him because he tended to side with big business, but not going to lie, he was a Republican and that was kind of a thing. Okay, it still kind of is a thing for them. I shouldn't say that because a lot of big businesses, like, I don't know, Starts with a G, rhymes with Moogle. Um, they're all Democrats, so apparently they really did. Parties really did switch sides. Let me stir this. I just realized I left the lid for this downstairs, which means I'm going to have to very carefully pour this to not get ice into my cocktail glass. Ah! Wrecked it. I was doing so good. If he had not served in that federal capacity under both Harrison and then Cleveland. He might not have come to the attention of President William McKinley, who tapped him to be the governor of the Philippines following the Spanish-American War, uh, which he really wasn't excited for. I mean, when, when he was like called in to talk to the president about this, he's like, hey, I was against the acquisition of the Philippines. And McKinley's like, yep, you're perfect for it. Let's, let's do this. You go be governor of the Philippines. And he did, uh, because you're called to service. And, and his father had served distinguished public career, and so Taft was talking to accepting this position. And that's where his life really took a turn, because he was actually quite adept as an administrator. And he came to enjoy the work, enough so that when Roosevelt wanted to appoint him to the Supreme Court in 1902, he declined based on his work in the Philippines was not quite done yet. So he didn't think he was done with that aspect of administration yet. Now, a year later, when Elio Root stepped down as Secretary of War, Roosevelt tapped Taft to step into the role, which Taft accepted in early 1904. And this kind of brought their relationship very close, and, and they continued in this close role through the remainder of Roosevelt's term and through his second term as president until June 30th, 1908, when Taft accepted the Republican nomination for president and had to step down in order to campaign. And it's not unreasonable to believe that the party of 
that, that excuse me that part of why he ran was successful based on Roosevelt's own popularity. It's not unreasonable to believe that part of why his run was successful, there we go, is based on Roosevelt's own popularity and that the people do Taft was Roosevelt's handpicked successor. So Roosevelt kind of was among the first to be kingmaker, if you will. Hmm. Sugar definitely adds a kick. Okay. Now, when he won, Taft was at first given positive review by the press, and his leadership style was praised as being calmer than Roosevelt's frenetic pace, but it wasn't long before the press began to turn on him, referring to him as lazy, which he wasn't. Not, I mean, not at all. He was, he was quite hardworking, but what he was was a judge, all right? He, he, the law was one of his passions, and he was looking at the legalities of the laws Congress was passing to see if they met the requirements under the Constitution, when Congress attempted to slide an income tax into a law, he vetoed it and said if they wanted an income tax, it should be passed as, a, as an amendment to the Constitution, which, um, which they did. So thanks for that, asshole. You know, sugar helps, but I'm not sure if I dig this one. But I mean, he wanted to keep things within the confines of what was legally allowed to do. So he, he did very much try to follow the Constitution while he was in the White House, which compared to Roosevelt's executive style was seen as a snail's pace by the press. Uh, he did propose a corporation tax, uh, which would basically be an excise tax on corporations and joint stock companies of 2% of their net annual income, which would also provide information about corporate organizations and represent, quote, a long step toward that supervisory control of corporations, which may prevent a further abuse of power. So he was trying to get the government to step in and have more control over corporations, and that was adopted by the Republicans basically to avoid having an alliance of progressives and low tariff Democrats draft a new bill with an income tax. And so the corporation tax was adopted. Now, along with the income tax, uh, several days later, excuse me, my pacing is so off today. So the corporation tax was adopted along with the income tax, which passed as the 16th amendment. 16th amendment was the income tax. And that passed in 1911, I think, whatever. We've all been paying for it for a hundred and some years now, so super excited about that. Now, at the same time, he also approved the passage of the Payne Aldrich Tariff Act, which was basically a joint House Senate bill which raised some key tariffs, but also allowed for the creation of a tariff board to study tariff modification in full for the use of Congress and President in future considerations. Now, the Republican Party at its core believed in protectionist tariffs, being really stiff tariffs on goods that were being imported. But of course, this had an impact on some industries, like um, I think newspapers were the ones cited because they would import wood pulp from Canada. And so they had their lobbyists pushing to get specific tariffs lowered while raising other tariffs that might you know, not impact them as much. Um, progressive Republicans, however, who had had a massive insurgence under Roosevelt's rule, urged that protectionist tariffs led to monopolies, uh, which is true, witness William Randolph Hearst and the rise of the newspaper industry, uh, which they weren't wrong on, right? But Taft's defense of the bill led to deeper rifts in the Republican Party. I mean, he, he <laughs> all right, so this book was written before Trump was a president, but he was basically doing a Trump, it's the best thing ever. This was the best tariff bill ever. No one could have done any better. And really, well, as Grover Cleveland learned, when you lower tariffs, business booms. So anyways, the next problem that Taft faced was when he replaced Secretary of the Interior James Rudolph Garfield, who had served under Roosevelt, with Richard A. Bollinger. Now, Bollinger overturned several conservation policies that Garfield had enacted. Um, this is where we're starting to see the buildup of the deep state, where none of this was actually passed by Congress. This was all done at the executive level with his heads of, of various departments just passing ordinate um, policies left, right, and center that were not voted on by Congress, but that take an act of Congress to overturn unless the next party comes in and overturns them on their own. Overturning those conservation policies made Ballinger grossly unpopular with conservation Republicans, which Roosevelt as, I mean, he, Roosevelt was a huge conservationist. Like that was one of his gifts to America was the conservation of the wildlands, right? And by extension, Taft's popularity waned because he was the one who had appointed Ballinger. The head of the U.S. Forest Service uh, Services would, who was a President McKinley appointee, Gifford Pinchot. I'm saying that wrong, I'm sure of it. Um, but Pinchot became convinced that Ballinger was looking to entirely stop conservation efforts and accused Ballinger of siding with private trust to determine to the detriment of conservation efforts. 
Now, additionally, one of Pinchot's friends, Louis Glavis, provided Taft with a 50-page report that accused Ballinger of improper interest in coalfield claims in Alaska. Now, let's pause here. I am parched this morning. Taft didn't just wave these away. He, he took it very seriously, and, and he took the allegation to Attorney General George Wickersham, and they did their due diligence, did an investigation, and ultimately issued a public letter that exonerated Ballinger, and Glavis was dismissed for insubordination, which was all above board and perfectly legal. There was no real scandal there. However, Pinchot took this personally and openly rebuked Taft which left Taft no choice but to dismiss him as well. Now, Pincha was a close friend of Roosevelt's. I mean, Taft would have said he was a close friend too, but with, with Pincha being, uh, Roosevelt, I think, essentially thought he was going to be a man behind the, the throne here and pull the strings and have, you know, direct Taft and everything else. But when Taft did this, that kind of started the fracture because suddenly Roosevelt's man is no longer in charge of a key part of the U.S. Forest Service and that that Roosevelt took personal like. This entire affair was fully investigated 20 years after the fact by Secretary of Interior Harold Ickes, who found that Taft and Ballinger had acted entirely correctly and that Pinchot was a publicity-seeking vindictive man. But in 1909-1910, when all this went down, it was scandalous. And to think that the president might be protecting his own man at the expense of conservation movements helped contribute to Taft's unpopularity in the day. Throughout his presidency, Taft traveled like 25,000 miles. I mean, he crisscrossed the country multiple times, made several trips to the uh, Panama Canal Zone because he was overseeing the building of it, making public speeches at every stop, stopping for whatever Republican needed a boost. And I kind of get the sense from 110 years removed that he was chasing the popularity that Roosevelt achieved naturally. Now, of course, I think Roosevelt was a narcissist, uh, but this tactic did not work for Taft because he just didn't have that charismatic personal draw that Roosevelt did. I think he wanted very much to be loved by the people, and when he was in office, he just wasn't. When Roosevelt returned from Africa and became so very discontented with how the country was being run under Taft, the friendship they'd had for 20 years broke. Now, part of the problem is that Roosevelt believed that the executive office, namely himself when he was the executive office, could discern what was a good trust and what was a bad trust. So he got this big reputation for being a trust buster when it was actually Taft who believed that the Sherman Antitrust Act, as written, passed, and signed into law, did not allow for the president to pick and choose who was the good guy and who was the bad guy. Basically, that the law needed to be applied equally to everybody, which is even today a completely shocking allegation for a chief executive to make. But say what he did, and even more so, Taft actually applied the Sherman Antitrust Act equally to all including friends of Roosevelt's, namely J.P. Morgan, who had essentially conned Roosevelt into looking the other way when the United States Steel purchased coal and iron. And I, I mean literally like coal and iron industries. And rather than admit that he had been conned, Roosevelt got just full-on butthurt over Taft's equal application of the law. When the government filed suit against United States Steel on October 26, 1911, the lawsuit said explicitly that in 1907, the president, then President Roosevelt, quote, was not made fully acquainted with the state of affairs in New York relevant to the transactions as they existed. The Roosevelt had not been fully advised. Basically, he'd been conned, right? U United States Steel had kept key information back that would have made it very clear they were building a monopoly. Roosevelt took this language very personally. And was the f this was like the final nail in the coffin of their friendship and basically the moment that Roosevelt determined to run again in 1912. Now, when Taft won the Republican nomination, Roosevelt, of course, branched off, formed his own party, the Bull Moose Party, which ultimately led to Wilson's election in 1912. And I kind of felt bad for Taft here. Not just that Wilson won. I mean, that was kind of a foregone conclusion as soon as Roosevelt started his own party. Like, Taft knew that that breach was going to lead to a Wilson win. Taft just wanted to win more votes than Roosevelt which clearly did not happen because Wilson won with an absolute landslide of 435 electoral votes. Roosevelt had 88 and Taft had just eight. Uh, he carried Utah and Vermont. He didn't even carry his home state of Ohio. It kind of felt bad for him there because he, he really did want to, he, he knew he was going to lose to Wilson, but he wanted to poll higher than Roosevelt and he didn't. But then something truly interesting happened. 
Uh, he handled his defeat with such dignity and grace that his popularity, which he'd been chasing for four years, skyrocketed. And the papers touted him as the epitome of good sportsmanship because of how graciously he was working with Wilson on the transition from the White House. Like, like sending Wilson letters on this is how the White House has been operating under me. You know, take it or leave it, but this is what I've been doing. This has been working. This hasn't been working. And that was seen as very dignified. But now he had to figure out what to do with the rest of his life, right? He was only 55 years old. And while he and his wife had been frugal during his time in the White House, man managing to save $2,000 a month from their salary or something, it was some absurd amount of money that, that netted them 100000 total. That wasn't really enough to live on for the rest of their lives when you don't know how long. I mean, enough for the rest of your life if you're President Polk who died 45 days out of office. Not enough if you're going to be, you know, President Taft who lives for another 20 years. So he briefly considered returning to the law. However, that option was quickly dismissed as he had appointed a large number of sitting judges in Ohio while he was in the White House, so he would never be able to argue a case in front of them because of a conflict of interest. He had also been in the absolutely unprecedented position of appointing six Supreme Court justices. He had six of them either die or step down under his administration. And uh, so he appointed more than half the court, and so he couldn't argue before the Supreme Court justices either. So the solution was handed to him when the administration of Yale University, no longer Yale College, now Yale University, reached out to him and offered him a professorship in law. So when he left the White House, he went to Yale, where he taught law until 1921, uh, when he was appointed as the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court. So he returned to his true love and passion, which was the law. I believe this makes him only the second. It's kind of growing on me. Makes him only the second former president to actually work post-presidency. Right, John Quincy Adams became a member of the House of Representatives, right? He was also the first congressman to actually die in chamber. And then Taft, who served as chief justice until he resigned on February 3rd, 1930. Uh, he died just over a month later on March 8th, 1930, at his home in Washington, D.C., and is buried in Arlington National Cemetery. Now, one of the things that history most remembers him for, and I'm mentioning this as an aside, it was briefly mentioned in the book, but thank God, I'm actually glad the author didn't focus on this, he just mentioned it, is that Taft is remembered as being the fattest president we've ever had, and when he was in office, he topped out at like 340 pounds. He was 5 foot 11, so that's, that's a big man. The author makes the point that this was likely stress eating, because once he was out of office, the weight more or less melted off. He lost 70 pounds in like a year and never again weighed over 300 pounds. When he passed away, he weighed 244 pounds, which is a much healthier weight for a man who is five foot 11. So, and I mentioned this because I think it's sad that his weight is what he's remembered for. Like he's mocked as being the fattest man in the White House, but what he should be remembered for is uh, being the jackass that gave Congress the idea to codify an income tax with an actual amendment to the constitution. That's what he should be remembered for. I actually think his greatest misfortune as being the president that was sandwiched between Roosevelt and Wilson. Now, in the decade immediately following his presidency, he was actually written about quite extensively. There is a two-volume set out there that details his life more fully. But then in the intervening years, uh, his own tenure has been overshadowed by Roosevelt on one side and Wilson on the other. Um, I do think this is a president where there is room for a more detailed analysis of his life. Like um, the, the Grover Cleveland book that I read a few months ago was absolutely outstanding. That shed a lot of light on a president that's been overlooked. I feel like there's room for somebody to pick up Taft and do a more detailed study on his life in the same way. I mean, this was a quick primer. It covered some of the highlights, but I do feel like he had kind of a short shrift, historically speaking. I mean, he lived 20 years after leaving the White House, and none of that was covered in this book beyond mentioning that he worked at Yale, then at the Supreme Court, which are not insignificant job postings. And one of the things he apparently covered in detail at his time in Yale was a strict adherence to the Constitution, which is clearly not being taught in law schools these days, judging by the caliber of elected officials we now have who think the Constitution is a dead document. Okay. This book was decent for what it covered, which was specifically how a little-known jurist from Ohio, literally, wasn't much about him, came to hold the most powerful position in the world for just four short years. I'm trying to decide where to place him on my personal ranking. I mean, I, I have a sense like he was likable. Like he was probably a genuinely likable person, not, not like some other presidents. 
um, and certainly progressive in his own way. I mean, he was the first president to appoint a woman to head a department in the federal government. I mean, there, there have been others who had hired women in federal jobs, but he actually hired the first woman to head a federal department, which was Julia Lathrop, who he appointed to head the newly created Children's Bureau in 1912. But he was not progressive in his interactions with the black community. I mean, he was always looking for, for ways to build up the white support in the South for the Republican Party, but he did so by stepping all over people, you know, black people who had served quite well in, in the Republican Party in the South since the end of the Civil War. So he would remove them and appoint white Republicans. And so, I mean, he basically adopted the Democrats' belief that black constituents were like children who needed coddling, which is not the case ever. They're, you know, humans and adults just like the rest of us. And then there's the income tax thing, which I mean, basically fucked us all for the next hundred years and counting. So, I mean, is that as evil as Jackson's treatment of the native tribes? I mean, maybe? Yes? No? I mean, because he didn't do the income tax thing in a vacuum, right? I mean, he did that with the help of Congress. So, I don't know. I don't know. I'll have to, I'll have to ponder this and see where I want to place him on my rankings. But uh, for now, that's it this week, guys. If you like what you saw, don't forget to subscribe, and I will see you guys next Sunday. Bye.